Welcome to the Lourdes Medical Staff presentation on sepsis based on the data from the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. During this presentation, we will review the epidemiology of sepsis. We will review the definitions and clinical features of systemic inflammatory response syndrome, sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. We will also review recognition of tissue hypoperfusion, review the sepsis resuscitation bundles, which are divided into three hour and three to six hour times, and we'll outline the current fluid resuscitation recommendations, antibiotic selections, the use of pressors, and we review the care of pediatric sepsis. In 2013, New York State Department of Health placed a sepsis mandate on health care facilities in the state of New York. Governor Cuomo mandated sepsis care after an incident in the New York City Hospital where a pediatric case was not recognized until it was too late to save the patient's life. This mandate requires us to develop a process to facilitate early recognition of patients with possible sepsis, establish time-based treatment goals with early administration of antibiotics, and a protocol-driven treatment plan to assure that all of the goal-directed therapy for sepsis is instituted. Sepsis epidemiology. Sepsis is quite common in hospitalized patients, and there was greater than 1.5 million cases of sepsis diagnosed in the United States in 2009, and this pattern has been increasing. Earlier statistics were somewhat difficult to come by because patients were oftentimes not admitted with the diagnosis of sepsis, developed this during their hospitalization, and this became their discharge diagnosis. More importantly, mortality, because of the focus on sepsis and using goal-directed therapy, has gradually declined approximately 10% from the 2004 to 2009 database reports. Pneumonia is by far the most common site of infection in approximately 50% of cases, but urinary and intra-abdominal sources are also common origins. Blood cultures, surprisingly, are only positive in about 33% of cases. Staph aureus and strep pneumonia are the most common gram-positive organisms isolated, where E. coli, Klebsiella species, and Pseudomonas are the most common gram-negative organisms identified. Let's review the risk factors for developing severe sepsis. There are host-related factors concerning patients' comorbid conditions with COPD, diabetes, HIV, cirrhosis, and malignancy being high risk factors. There are also factors related to age, sex, and race being higher in the elderly and infants, males greater than females. Access of care issues, genetic predistribution, and pathogen related. There are multi-drug resistant organisms such as MRSA, Pseudomonas. There are also institutional considerations where patients seem to be rapidly recognized and have their treatment plan initiated with fluid resuscitation and antibiotics delivered in rapid fashion. Let's review our definitions. SIRS, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Sepsis is actually SIRS plus a systemic manifestation of an infection. Severe sepsis is organ injury due to hypoperfusion secondary to sepsis. And septic shock is sepsis-induced hypotension despite fluid resuscitation. We review these definitions as they apply clinically. SIRS can be best described as a clinical manifestation of dysregulated inflammation and has been routinely associated with infectious and non-infectious processes, such as autoimmune disorder, pancreatitis, and thromboembolic disease. SIRS and early sepsis cannot be readily distinguished at times. When SIRS criteria are present, it should always prompt an evaluation to eliminate an infectious source. SIRS criteria are based on temperature, a low temperature less than 96.8 or a temperature greater than 100.4, a heart rate greater than 90 beats per minute, respiratory rate greater than 20, white blood cell count less than 4,000, greater than 12,000, or a normal count with 10% bands. When this criteria is met, a SIRS alert or fire in your electronic medical record to alert you of the possibility of a septic patient. Here is an example of a SIRS alert in our Cerner system. Let's review some diagnostic criteria for sepsis. As sepsis is a consequence of a dysregulated inflammatory response but to an infectious insult, 
There are general variables to consider, inflammatory hemodynamic organ dysfunction variables, and tissue perfusion variables. The signs and symptoms of early septus can be very subtle. General variables would include fever, hypothermia, heart rates, respiratory rates, importantly altered mental status, early delirium, and hyperglycemia, which greater than 140 milligrams per deciliter in the absence of diabetes be early general variables that are present. Inflammatory values include elevated or decreased white blood cell counts, a normal white blood cell count with greater than 10% bands, a CRP that is elevated at least two standard deviations above normal, and if available, procalcitonin measures greater than two standard deviations above normal. Hemodynamic variables would be considering systolic blood pressure is less than 90, or systolic blood pressure decrease of greater than 40 millimeters of mercury from baseline, or mean arterial pressure less than 70. Organ dysfunction variable would include respiratory findings consistent with hypoxemia, urinary findings consistent with oligouria with less than 0.5 cc's per kilogram per hour for at least two hours despite adequate fluid resuscitation, and increasing creatinine greater than 0.5 milligrams per deciliter, and INR that is elevated, platelet counts less than 100,000, hyperbilirubinemia with a bilirubin greater than four. There are also tissue perfusion variables. At the cellular level, we would measure an elevated increased serum lactate, we, and on a macroscopic level, we were able to see decreased capillary refill or modeling with evidence of decreased peripheral perfusion, as is displayed in this accompanying picture. Definition of severe sepsis would include sepsis induced tissue hypoperfusion or organ dysfunction, manifested as elevated lactate, decreased urinary output, acute lung injury manifested as hypoxia or a low PaO2, creatinine elevation, elevation of your bilirubin, coagulopathy with elevated INR, and decreased platelet counts. The definition of septic shock simply stated is sepsis-induced hypotension persisting despite adequate fluid resuscitation. This fluid resuscitation is 30 cc's per kilogram of crystalloid. Septic shock is a type of vasodilatory or distributive shock. The treatment of sepsis syndromes are based on evidence-based guidelines from the Surviving Sepsis Campaign work. Early goal-directed therapy is initiated after a positive SERS alert. The physician is notified. Blood cultures and other appropriate cultures, as well as the CBC and lactate levels, are ordered. And then, after examining the patient, the physician believes the findings are consistent with infection. Antibiotics need to be given within one hour, and fluid resuscitation initiated as appropriate. Do not delay antibiotic therapy for greater than 45 minutes to obtain cultures. And remember, if a vascular device is present, port, TLC, etc., draw one set of culture from each port in addition to another peripheral location. This is a very busy slide, but if the surge screen is positive, we order a stat lactate, CBC, and cultures. The physician identifies the patient as potentially being septic, administration of broad spectrum antibiotics, and Fluids are initiated in our zero to three hour goal directed therapy. Then the patient is admitted to the hospital and the zero to six hour goals of therapy for severe sepsis are initiated to maintain a CVP of between eight to 12, maintain MAP, maintain urine output, and normalize lactate as goals. This slide further highlights the treatment funnels what is needed to be completed within three hours. Most importantly is administration of broad spectrum antibiotics and in the second six hours to maintain or improve oxygenation and central venous pressure. After fluid resuscitation and the patient is continually underperfused, vasoconstrictor therapy is necessary. Norepinephrine is the vasoconstrictor of choice. The next few slides concern the utilization of empiric antibiotic therapy for severe sepsis and septic shock. For an unclear source, there's a primary regimen and there's also a beta-lactam allergic regimen. If your suspected source is bacterial meningitis, empiric therapy would include this primary regimen, 
of ceftriaxone, vancomycin, dexamethasone, and then the beta-lactam allergic regimen. This slide lists the empiric therapy for suspected pulmonary sources for community-acquired pneumonia, pneumonia with risk factors for pseudomonas, and healthcare-associated pneumonia. This slide out outlines specific treatment for abdominal or biliary sources, skin soft tissue, urinary or necrotizing so skin and soft tissue infections. This slide lists the suggested treatment for invasive fungi, viral meningitis, and catheter-related bloodstream infections. The entire treatment package for septic patients is available in the sepsis power plan, diagnostic studies, fluids, antibiotic choices, and bundleized care is all outlined in this program. Part two of our program is a consideration of our pediatric patients. The difficulty of defining and diagnosing sepsis in these patients is over 40,000 cases per year and approximately 10% death rate with this disease with annual health care costs of $2 billion. SIRS Alert will also fire for pediatric patient with temperatures less than 36 or greater than 38.5, abnormal pulse, which is age-specific, as you will see in a subsequent slide, abnormal respirations, which are age-specific, and leukocyte counts, which are either elevated or depressed or have greater than 10% immature neutrophils present. Fever is the most common presenting symptom in the pediatric case, and the discomfort with fever makes assessment more difficult. Impediments to assessment also include vital signs, norms based on age, lack of objective criteria, reluctance to overtreat routine illness like otitis media, and the known resilience of an otherwise healthy child. Phlebotomy also creates difficulty in assessing these patients. When you identify your pediatric patient as high risk for sepsis, obtain IV access, laboratory studies, CBC, lactate, and blood cultures, and then assess for symptoms that are suggestive of organ dysfunction, such as cardiovascular findings with cool, mottled extremities, altered mental status, lethargic, patient being lethargic, respiratory compromise, decreased urinary output, elevated liver function test, importantly, an elevated lactate and metabolic acidosis. In our pediatric sepsis power plan, we have developed a pediatric sepsis early recognition tool where identification of SIRS criteria is based on specific age group. This is a busy slide that outlines the treatment approach for our pediatric patients. We identify high-risk patients and once they're identified, specific management includes rapid access with either IV or IO therapy, fluid resuscitation, diagnostic studies including CBC cultures, and lactate and early antibiotics, ideally within less than 60 minutes, and then constant reassessment of the patients to assess for continued perfusion deficits. Here's a patient with a functioning interosseous device, and just a reminder of the process of early identification, rapid access, obtain cultures, antibiotics within one hour, appropriate airway, and ventilation management as necessary, and frequent reassessment to guide your resuscitation. Thank you for your time and attention. Remember to use the SIRS alert as a trigger to evaluate the patient for a possible septic etiology. If the suspicion is high, initiate the sepsis power plan. This would facilitate the ordering of diagnostic studies, antibiotic therapy, fluid resuscitation, and establish the goal-directed therapeutic regimen.